Mark Larkham, who... I apologise, Larko. I've, I just, I don't know why I thought you were in Sydney, mate, but you're in Brisbane and your buggers don't have daylight saving. What's wrong with you? Couldn't pay me enough money to live in Sydney, mate. <laughs> <laughs> are, they, are they ever going to change this goddamn daylight saving thing or not? Oh, see, yeah, look, it, it's frustrating, mate. It's, it's a real backward thing and... I totally get, because if you look at the curvature of Australia, I totally get why up the top end they wouldn't want it. Um, but it's when you look, I mean, Brisbane is pretty well the most eastern uh, tip. If there's ever a place that you'd want daylight savings, it's here where it would work. So I don't know why they don't just do the southeast corner. Um, to, to, I mean, from a business perspective, it is really counterproductive. We miss you in the morning, we miss you at lunchtime, and we miss you at the end of the day. Right. The other states, I mean. Supercars, first of the Gen 3. And so there was always a lot of talk about this, and I've been so looking forward to picking your brain. After all the pre-season angst and the chitty chat about it, and, you know, even the drivers, Shane Van Gisbergen, saying it was bloody boring and didn't like it and complaining about the cars and that. Now we look back at the whole of the season. So first and foremost, how do you assess those cars and the actual racing and the future of these cars? Um, it's a really good question, Martin. Well, you know, I mean, I'm employed by supercars, so I'm obviously not going to get on here and slam them, but I can, I don't need to, because I honestly think, um, I, I said in the telecast at the end of the weekend, um, I reckon a big tick, and I tell you why, because Erebus Motorsport just won the championship. And, you know, we've come from a sport that for so many years, the championships have, you know, apart from the really odd occasion, have been the domain of the, you know, the homologation teams, the factory back teams, the, you know, the couple of big teams that represented red versus blue. So... When we went to Gen 3, amongst all the stuff that we wanted to do from a racing point of view, like pulling the downforce off, etc., we can talk about, but one of the main objectives was to take out some cost. And yes, I acknowledge that there has been an increasing cost as a consequence of having to build your cars and your spares and engines. But I can tell you now, I'm seeing some of the stuff on paper. The costs are starting now to dramatically reduce and they will going forward because previously... We had, you know, if you wanted to make a front lower wishbone, you'd go up and down the pit lane. There was a set of guidelines, but there'd be 15 different variants, and each team would change that variant multiple times in a year as they developed their car. Yep. So to just do that, you needed a CAD designer and equipment, and welders and milling machines and all that. So it was just horrendously expensive. What Gen 3 did is took away all of that and said, no, no, we're going to leave you the flexibility in the competition parts and tuning the race car, but all of the stuff is going to have commonality about it. So that meant that a team like Erebus could prevail where historically they wouldn't have been able... I had my team. I couldn't develop the parts to keep up with the factory teams. Right. So I think that's a wonderful endorsement of what Gen 3 was about. Ten different race um, winners this year, six last year, seven the year before. Can we tie those stats to this? Absolutely we can. I mean, with great respect, I don't think um, the likes of LeBrock or Mark Winterbottom was, you know, a chance at a podium here and there, you know, being race winners. Again, thorough endorsement of, of the category. And, you know, take Shane's extraordinary, Shane Van Gisbergen's extraordinary talent out of it. Wow, by God. I mean, and can't wait for next year because, I mean, there's just so many potential race winners. So, yeah, I do. I mean, we took the arrow off Martin to make them harder to drive. Yep. To bring the game more back to the drivers. We took a lot of that technology out that we talked about and the ability to develop the car. So, you know, the likes of a Triple Eight or a Tickford could not just endlessly develop components. And when they pulled them out of the back of the truck on, you know, Thursday afternoon, bang, they're just in the box straight away. Well, now we're not seeing that. And I think the other thing we saw evidence of this year, uh, and I think it even hurt Shane a little bit, I think some of the more mature drivers, the more experienced drivers like Shane, not all of them, most of them, seem to just struggle a little bit. And I think a lot of that's muscle memory and years of tuning the car with the downforce that you had, which is a big implicator, where... Now, look at some of these young guys prevailing that 
you know, you're right, Shane was quite negative about the car. Go and talk to a lot of the other guys that actually weren't. So it's it was different for different people. Larko is with us, Mark Larko, and we're talking supercars. Are they, I mean, I'm going to ask you some, some questions here, and some of them are always dumb, and I know that you're very gentle with me about that, but are they, are they easier to drive? I don't know what I mean by asking you that, but I know that you'll know. What are they? No, they're not easier to drive. They're, they're actually made harder to drive, but what, what happened, I think a lot of the easy come out, you know, and again, I'm not having a go at Shane, but Shane made some statements on several occasions that you drive around it. Yeah, he said it was boring 50, and everything. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Mm. Which, which, which I don't like when they say that. I think I've said it to you before, Martin. The art of race driving is driving as fast as you can to the grip of the tyre without killing the, dry, the tyre. So it's no difference to a marathon runner. He doesn't sprint in the first kilometre. He conserves his energy because he's going as fast as he can over the distance, right? Yep. That's what you do. Yep. He doesn't go slow. He doesn't run at 50%. He runs as fast as he can to make it over the distance with the maximum performance. That is the art of race driving in F1, in NASCAR, IndyCar, and our game. It's just how it's always been. So because we took the downforce off, what Shane's referring to is, you know, yes, you have to drive to the tyre because it'll slide more easily without the downforce, so that actually makes it more of a challenge. Now, because that then becomes sometimes a number that they drive to because they pre-calculate a lot of this stuff, I get what he's saying. But I actually wish when he said that in the press conference at Bathurst, I think was one of the times where he said he was driving around at 60 or 80%, whatever. One of the journos in the room needed to ask the guy that came second, well, that's not very good. If Shane was driving around at 60%, you must have been driving yeah, around at 50%. 50, that's right. Why the hell weren't you driving around at 100% there you drive go. past him? Yeah. I, I think that makes the point. So uh, they were made to be harder to drive. Now, can I just acknowledge, I actually think as a category, we made a little mistake at Bathurst with good intention. We took them there on soft tyres this year, Martin, softer than they've ever been, thinking that that would really spice it up, you know, more performance and all the rest of it. But what happened is the softer tyre was more prone to degrading because it is softer, it gets hotter quicker. Um, so drivers were being extra careful. Then you saw by the end of the race, there was all the marbles offline, which are a result of the soft tyre. So they had to be extra careful to not hit the marbles. So that means you're sort of driving around on some tram tracks. And the result of that, that lack of risky driving, we didn't see the safety cars that we always bank on in the last, you know, 40 or 50 laps of Bathurst. So I think we'll revisit that decision. Again, it was made with good intent. and uh, Sometimes you just don't know these things till you roll sure. them out. So in hindsight, you know, I think that Bathurst didn't prove to be one of our best because of the tyre. When I asked you about 10 different um, race winners, the key to that is the competitiveness of it. And, you know, you mentioned a couple of guys, Frosty and that, getting wins. Um, you know, uh, Matt Payne coming in here at the end, winning in, in Adelaide. And, and as a fan, that's what, what we want to see. And I'm not, I'm not hacking on F1 here, but, you know, every motor racing fan kind of sighs and groans when it's just like, oh, God, not again. And Red Bull is saying that, oh, you know, Verstappen's going to come out and win every single bloody race next year. I mean, eventually, the, those on the fringe who aren't that interested in it and aren't at that diehard lose a bit of interest because of that. It's like any sport, like if Man City are winning every single game in the Premier League, all of a sudden you stop watching it a little bit. So in terms of the competitive aspect of it, is, was this part of this done to improve that? And, and because McLaughlin had been so dominant, because Wind Cup had been so dominant, because Giz had been so dominant? Absolutely. And again, I, I rest my case. I reckon we saw evidence of this, Martin. And, you know, uh, you know, we saw the championship go to the wire, you know, at the, at, the, at the last round. We saw those multiple winners. We saw with the parody debacle, which is a whole other conversation. When, when I say debacle, debacle in terms of, the you know the angst that it creates and uh, i've said many times we you know as a result of all the good work that has been done making these cars perform the similar right because you it's 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 called sporting parity or technical parity sorry because what you're trying to do is give each team and driver the same opportunity now what they do with that opportunity then comes down to the driver and team but you've got to give them the same performance opportunity yeah, right. so we try technical parity and because we've got the cars so close, and trust me, mate, I've seen the data, I've seen the engine data, I've seen the aero data, it is remarkable how close they are. The problem with that is that then if you have the tiniest little indiscretion or difference between the two, which I think we have seen with the Ford during the year, 
the tiniest. Like I can barely see it on a piece of paper. Uh, and on other times, like the Bend and stuff there and the Darwin, the, the Mustang was actually quicker than the Camaro in a straight line. So you can see how complex this is. But once you have the tiniest discrepancy between the two, it actually magnifies it. And, and I can assure you that I've seen differences this year uh, between same drivers in the same car and the same team far greater than I saw between Camaro and Mustang. But when you put a group of them together and then you rely on what we call a parity trigger, which monitors the top cars on each side and their average of lap time in a race when you take out all the bad laps and blah, 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 and you get a really accurate, true picture of performance... But there's not a parity adjustment, Martin, until there's five consecutive races where the time is triggered, where one manufacturer is faster than the other by one-tenth of a second in 60 seconds. Now, think about that. That's a lot to trigger. But in our game, one-tenth of a second in 60 seconds is a mile. Oh, yeah. So I actually, you know, I, personally, I think we, because we've done such a good job, and even though they've gone off to the wind tunnel now to make it even better, yep. and we're going to put the car, what's called a transient dyno, to make it even better, so it can take any argument about away, I think we've also got to revisit the parity model because, again, it's too big. One-tenth of a second in 60 seconds for me is too big. It needs to be more like, you know, five one-hundredths of a second or three one-hundredths of a second because they are that close, and we just want to make sure they're the same. Now, look. Let's hope after the aero tunnel work and the transient dyno work that there is the, the argument's finished. They are the same, same. But I tell you, we're picking at small bits here, mate. There's nothing in it. Margins and tyre degradation. Every time you mention either of those, Larko, I, 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 I just have to start playing this music, mate. I just, there's just something, I don't know, I just I love it, mate. I just can't stand it. I love it so much. You know, I know, I know there's a... There's a I, <laughs> I need help. I do. <laughs> in, ter- no, we, in terms of the Holden Heads and the Ford Ferals, have those diehard fans, and that's what the sport is about. And I know this is what I love you so much, mate, when you're on, because you talk to us, you talk to the fans, you talk in a language that us fans can understand. Have those fans generally accepted the fact that there is no Ford, there is no Holden? Because that was always going to be an issue this year. Yes, they have, Martin. Um, and... It's a really, it's a really good question, and you know, it was important that we got, you know, all the red jacket Holden fans to 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 come across, and you know, I think we need to remember that the GM Camaro is General Motors, and if you go back right to the start of our championship and the early Bathurst, that first two door Monaro that rocked up there had a 327, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 327, had a little GM badge on it, so it's very much the same DNA. Uh, and Ford, well, you know, you can buy a Mustang in Australia. But you're dead right. It was important. I mean, we couldn't do anything about the shutdown of the Holden factory and the shutdown of the, the building of Falcons in this country. And just mentioning that just devastates me because they were just world-class cars. And then, you know, I go to all the races and I said to some Kiwi people that we were chatting with on the weekend, when I go to New Zealand race, and I love the fact that we're going back there, I love spending time with your fans because... Honestly, and I mean this hand on heart, Martin, I've said it before, I reckon you guys are even more wedded to this concept than we are in Australia. So we need the Kiwi fans to come with us on the journey because it still is, uh, you know, at the base, it still is red versus blue. Oh, yep. that, oh, yep. mm. uh, that That is, and I've had Roger Penske say it to me, I had Alan Gauss of the BTCC say it to me years ago. By God, Mark, you guys are so lucky what you've got out here. Don't change a thing. You know, do you, do you really think in Europe anyone gives a crap about Audi versus BMW versus Ferrari? No, versus Bentley? no, they don't. Oh, no. Well, or maybe the Ferrari, maybe the Ferrari still got that Italian kind of connection. Yeah, but you're, you're exactly right. Well, look, can I keep you for about three or four minutes? I've just got, I just want to go through some drivers. No, I mean, no, hurry. You're, you're good, mate. All okay. Good. Um, goodbye, the Giz. His impact, uh, his career. In terms of the other great drivers, the superstars that you've seen, not just recent ones, but also going back in time, how special has that guy been? I think, and I even include Scott McLaughlin, who, you know, you, we'll never know if they stayed longer, you know, would Scotty have gone on to be our greatest ever? Highly likely. Um, you know, there's just a real complete package on and off the track. Um, Shane, I don't think we've actually seen a more gifted driver Martin, in terms of his racing brain is off the dial good. He just keeps doing little things that we just go, 
wow. Roland Dane has said it to me face to face. You know, he, he, he agrees with that. So, you know, we're a Jamie through sheer hard work, persistence, incredible talent, data, all the rest of it becomes our greatest driver of all time. Um, Shane Van Gisbergen works hard, but he's just got this, he, he, you know, he's, he's, he's a tad, you know, well, I don't like to use the word eccentric, but he's, he's different to all of us. And his ability to read things like the tyre and exactly what it's doing in relationship to the car, what it's doing in terms of relationship to the road and his strategy with fuel load and all those other things, his ability to read traffic and what other drivers... Can, it's like he was put on this earth just to be a racing driver. Mm. He'll never make a paid agent. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, or a different. PR consultant, will he? I mean, let's be honest about no, it. But, you know, and, and sometimes we're, you know, maybe we're a bit harsh on him. Maybe sometimes we're fair. But, you know, when you're as good as him, you probably don't have to worry too much about the media. And sometimes I think, oh, come on, mate, you need to play the game a bit better. But then other times I think, Martin, he's just a little introverted and he's a little, you know, a little awkward with the media stuff. I, I, I just don't know. But, you know, at the end of the day, I love the racing driver bit, you know, and he, he, he really... Well, you've been a driver, mate. That's what you are. Mm. You've been a driver. I mean, that's, you know, look, and it's... You know, we we demand a lot of our athletes. I mean, we've just been talking today, uh, Larko, about Owen Farrell, the the uh, Pommy rugby skipper who's taken the Six Nations off because he just says he needs to kind of get his mental health right and and, and kind of prioritising his family and that. Look, I mean, you know, these guys are our, are our rock and roll. They're rock and roll on a racetrack. We do demand a lot of them. But when it comes down to it, what do we want from them? I just want Van Gisbergen to drive like he does. And to drive like he does, there's got to be a little bit of air in centre. There's got to be a, a little bit of wild man in there, doesn't there? I mean, you've done this. You know, there are times when you're in that car and you're driving like that where you, I don't, you, you, you don't feel reckless, but you feel like you're almost unbreakable, that you will take that little risk. That's what he's got, isn't he? Hundred percent, he has. You know, and that's what we love about Shane. And what, why I was disappointed for him on the weekend that he couldn't get his car sorted because, he, and Brody Kostecki is the same sort of character. These guys um, are prepared. Well, Jamie Winkup's probably the best I've ever seen. Look at Jamie Winkup, mate. He's thrown away Bathurst a couple of times, overtaking safety cars when he shouldn't have, that's running right. out of fuel. Yes, yes. Prepared to win the race at all costs, and if it meant losing with second place, so be it. And don't you love that about any any athlete? But, you know, I guess in the modern era where it's changed a little bit, um, and unless you're a Shane Van Gisbergen or an Ayrton Senna who are so good at their craft that they don't have to worry too much about all the media stuff and all the off-track stuff, um, so, it, it, you know, and, and maybe that allows them then to focus more on whatever makes them, you know, them, them tick. Yep. Well, well, so be it. And occasionally we get that. But as the... The world has become more commercialised. Our sport has become so heavily commercialised. The fans and the sponsors all want, you know, a piece of the action, and rightly so. It becomes incumbent on, you know, all the key players to to be a little bit savvy and a little bit more aware in that area. But, you know, and, and Shane, as you know, and, and, and others before him, um, Marcus Ambrose, uh, even Scafie, they weren't guys that went out seeking media. And what you'll find is that as you start to go down the grid and the performance isn't quite there, the media stuff sort of ramps up to sort of cover off a little bit of it, doesn't it? So, um, you know, uh, we probably all wish we could be as good as Shane Van Gisbergen and not go chasing media stories because, our, you know, we just do our talking on the track. And he said that many times. You know, and that's, that's him as a character. So I think, you know, I, I, I think he's thrown um, a, a nice little curveball into the mix and it's that complexity of character uh, that we need. You know, if everyone's the same, it's pretty boring, isn't exactly it? So right. we, we need, yeah, let's hope Brody's the next one because he is a little bit of that. We saw it when he burst onto the scene with Jamie in 2019 or 18, or was it Bathurst? You know, we was a co-driver and remember Jamie crashed into the fence trying to avoid Brody because Brody was just taking it to Jamie as a as a young upstart that didn't care that it was Jamie Winkups on the name on the side of the car. It was just another race car. Man, I love that stuff. Two quick questions, we'll let you go. Um, so thrilled for Matt Payne. That was a hell of a race. I love that track, that Adelaide track, man. I know it's um, you know it's, it's it's part of the old F1 track and that. It just looks like such a fun track to race. Talk to yeah. us about about this young man. Well, I've been following him for a little while. I had a little bit a little bit to do in the background just with some of the decision making early in his career with some of his sponsors and team, whatever, you, to make sure that he went the right route around to get where he is and. You know, good on him because he did. You know, he did all the learning in New Zealand, 
uh, good in so many classes. And I, I say to Ian Martin, your tracks over there, you know, Taupo, Wegram, Pukekohe, Manford, all those great tracks you have that are gnarly, fast, wet, dangerous, clearly conditioning your drivers and engineers and mechanics for a bigger, better deal when they go out there into the world and the circuits aren't so gnarly. So my strong tip to New Zealand is don't change your circuits, um, you know, because now we've got, you know, Stanaway, Payne, you've still got Ham, Heimgartner there. So Matt did all his learning there and it was really obvious right from when he hit the, the, the button here in a supercar, hang on, this kid's got something a little special and it's taken a little while as it always does and that's what you've got to do. You've got to accept, you know, just, hey, just in this pack, Finish 12th and finish. Now a 10th, now an 8th, and you just keep building. He's just been building, and the second half of 23, wow. I mean, he's never been on Adelaide. He's never been on the Adelaide circuit. And, I mean, the, the kid is talented. He can qualify the car. He doesn't make mistakes, Martin. When you're driving at that pace, on the edge, sliding the car, throwing around a ton and a half like that, so many guys throw it into the sand trap. Already he's a young bloke. He's shown his ability to, A, not make mistakes, but not do silly stuff. The way he managed his tyres over the duration of that descent. The way he prevailed under pressure at his young age. Um, get ready. I reckon he's the next one. And I like him. I, I see, I've, I've known him for a while now, and I get on really well with him. He's a fun character as well. So, uh, yeah, I reckon you're in good shape. Piston pumping engine thumping big bangers, man. I mean, <laughs> Larko, you're not driving an electric car yet, are you, mate? Oh, you're kidding me, aren't Stop you? Stop it, eh? <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> Tell Stop me it. you've still wait, got wait. you've still got eight under what? the hood. Tell me you've still got eight. Uh, mate, seriously, wait, no, well, I've got a twin turbo diesel U, right? I live on the farm, so I drive a U. But the but Martin, you know, I, I don't want to sit here and bash up EV, but, you know, I, I worry on, on two fronts. When the fires start and become more frequent as the uh, frequency of EVs come up, because we're already seeing a lot of that, and the other thing I really worry about, you know, we've all had kids co grow up and go through school and uni or whatever and get their first, you know, all my kids had the cheap $5,000 Corolla or whatever mm -hmm. it might have been. Yep. Uh, so I don't know what's going to happen with these kids when they're sold, you know, an ex-fleet government electric car that, here, you can have it, it's got bugger all kilometres on it. Oh, by the way, it needs a $22,000 battery in it, <laughs> you know, because the battery's done yeah. now after five or six. Oh, seriously, how's that going to work? And then when they start crashing into each other on the roads and T-bone each other and there's wires cut in the thing and there's injured people inside, you're not going to be able to touch the vehicle because of the electrification. Now, they went through all of this in F1 and um, they had to do a heap of training, have special equipment, all the marshals now and all the points. have got special equipment, there's special lights and things on the cars so they know when it's safe to touch the car or not. Back in their factories when they work on the car, they've got all these weird-ass deployment systems and evacuation systems because this whole high-voltage battery stuff. So we haven't even had that chat about that no. stuff, mate. It's like we got... Anyway, yeah, don't get me going to... Uh, the, 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 Mark, let me, uh, let me... I don't want to put the nail in the EV cotton, but we, we all want to protect the environment. You know, I live on a farm. Of course we do. But I often say, mate, when I started driving, I think I was driving a, you know, a HQ ute, one tonne or whatever, and it was probably getting, you know, 24 miles to the gallon. And now, you know, 30 years later, I drive a two-ton ute with twin turbos on it and a little 2.2-litre engine, and it's running around at 8.3 litres to the 100. And you know as well as I do, I can go out and buy any little car now that'll do three and four litres to the, to the 100. So why on earth we just didn't stay the course because we got catalytic converters and all that sort of stuff. They're not spewing out junk out the exhaust pipes anymore. In a minute, we'll be doing a litre to the 100 and we'll be using 900cc engines with three turbos on them. I just don't know why we didn't stay that course. But anyway, now you've got me fired up. 24 minutes you've given us, mate. You're so generous with your time. I love you to bits. Thank you so much uh, for everything you've done for us on air this year, but better than that for uh, doing your job because you do it so well. And I've been saying, I keep saying it on air, that you're just brilliant at it, mate. You actually, you sell it to us, you show it, you tell it to us uh, in a way that no one else does. More power to you, dude. And let's talk again next year. Thank you, Martin. That's very kind. Can I just finish by saying every time we have these chats, I've got to get a little approval from supercars because of my contract. And in every one of them, I say it's Martin again and what you do for the sport over there in New Zealand and your passion, probably pretty well equally matched with mine, mate. So love it. Oh, good on you, Lark. I appreciate that very much, mate. Mark Larkham, ladies and gentlemen. Good long chat about supercars.